Coming up today, we catch up with sports writer at the National in UAE, Paul Radley, to discuss emerging players struggling to get a game across the men's and women's IPL and all the pressing issues of the game in the country. But first, a shout out to those who support us on Patreon. From as little as $2 US a month as a patron, you can access bonus content at Emerging Cricket and have a say on the show's direction. To sign up, log on to Patreon. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash Emerging Cricket. A lot to discuss this week. Let's get straight into it. Hello and welcome to another Emerging Cricket Podcast. I'm Daniel Beswick. You will hear from Tim Cutler and Nick Skinner in a few moments when we speak to Paul Radley. But first, a wrap of everything in the game this week. The Oman women's team has teamed up with a local delivery company as a sponsor for the next two years. The women's team have won three of their first nine T20 internationals to Africa and the Botswana Cricket Association has been nominated for the National Sport Association of the Year for the 40th edition of the Botswana Sports Awards. Botswana plan to bid to host both the Under-19 Cricket World Cup Africa Qualifier and the ICC Women's Qualifier. And finally, plans for turf cricket grounds in Nigeria have suffered a major setback after the national governing body failed to find suitable clay for the surface. Clay was examined from 10 sites in the southwest of the country, though none were deemed acceptable for pitch preparation. That's your update in the Emerging Game this week. Up next, we chat to Paul Radley in UAE. Hey guys, it's John T. Rhodes coming to you on the Emerging Cricket Podcast from a hot and sweaty Dubai. But tell you what, the game is growing all around the world and I'm coming to you next from Sweden. Well, at the Emerging Cricket Podcast, we've been lucky to welcome several guests from all around the world. We return to UAE once again. Welcome in our guest, fellas. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, we welcome sports writer for the national newspaper in Abu Dhabi, Paul Radley. Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Daniel. Good to be with you guys. Been waiting for this call for ages. <laughs> I'm surprised Tim never reached out any earlier. What what was happening there, Tim? Is that your fault? Why, why is that something my fault? Like, Bez, you're apparently the host. Nick edits the thing. Radis sends us stories every other... Yeah, okay, it's my fault. <laughs> yeah, t- Tim's got the biggest Rolodex out of out of us three. The biggest black book. <laughs> I apologise, Radis. You, like, you, are, you are ultimate friend, friend of the podcast, and it's good to have you on. Rather than us being bitter about the past, we can only <laughs> look forward great to be here oh that's very presidential of you tim <laughs> well someone's got to be don't they <laughs> it's topical topical indeed now paul you've you guys have been a beneficiary of some cricket in in your part of the world what's been india's loss has been uae's gain with the ipl and the women's ipl being featured in parts of uae How, how's it been for you covering a lot of that i'm sure in your normal day job with so much cricket around and I guess unexpectedly having it on your shores. Yeah, it's interesting really because it's obviously been good because it's been cricket that's been happening that wouldn't otherwise have been happening and it has been here technically. Not that, you know, I haven't been able to cover it. Journalists haven't been allowed in the in the grounds. Obviously fans haven't been allowed in the grounds. So it's been popular here in the UAE because there's obviously a massive Indian population here and they're getting to see cricket and there's tinged with a little bit of excitement that every time you go, you drive past the ground you know that the game's happening there or it's been happening there in the past couple of days. Other than that you've also got that sort of tinge of frustration that you're not actually seeing it live anyway so there's a little bit of distance still from it but it's cricket so Great. It is frustrating. I kind of understand that where I'm, I'm not sure exactly what, what you're doing on, on a day-to-day basis, but you're having to watch the games on television like so many other people, but yet you're so close to all the action. And it becomes very difficult because I think everyone wants to get that human side of sport and being able to, to physically be with people and asking questions and, and getting quotes from talent and stuff like that. So what are you now doing in that in that situation given that you're working from home? Yeah, so it's, it's I suppose similar to most people that have had this experience so far of covering cricket remotely so you're keeping up to date with the with the match action obviously as everybody else is and then through the contacts that you've made with the teams trying to get a few stories that way and some teams are amenable to it some are absolutely awful for it and otherwise looking for things that are unique to the tournament that might make a story like last week 
I went down to Sharjah actually. Sharjah is the only ground where you really get a sense that there's a game going on inside the ground because Abu Dhabi you can't really get near the stadium. Dubai, exactly the same, you're miles away. But in Sharjah, you actually, it's just over the other side of the world that the match is happening. And as a consequence, you see a lot of balls actually hit into the road. So I went and joined some diehard fans who can't be without IPL. And stood outside the ground, waiting for the waiting with them waiting for the balls to be hit into the road. And um, it's quite a skill to it. It was actually amazingly enough. I was talking to a guy, um, trying to find out his backstory, why he was there. He actually lives in a flat just above, but maybe four stories up. So he's got perfect view of the ground anyway. And he's cricket mad, and he's got fairy lights that say four and six in his window that you can see. So obviously cricket obsessive. And as I was talking to him, getting the background on his story. He bolts off from speaking to me and runs into the road in the middle of traffic and grabs the balls come over the fence. Like, it's literally the first person I was speaking to. It was amazing. <laughs> like, how he saw the ball, I don't know, because you get no sense. Usually if it was a big match situation, if it was a match day where there was a crowd in, you get the sense of the crowd roaring that the ball's it's been a big hit. So you've got a little bit of a steer that it might be coming in your direction. Um, and how he saw it when it's obviously silent over the other side of the wall, I don't know. Um, yeah, but that was the closest any of us have got to the IPL this year. So do they do they keep the ball, or do, does someone from the venue come and disinfect it and, and bring it back to the match? No, no, they keep it. They they can't take it back inside because they they wouldn't use it again. They wouldn't disinfect it. Um, so that's a souvenir. That's why they're all lining up there. Mm. And that guy actually, that was the second ball. I think who was it? it was Shubman Gill hit that one. Kolkata Knight Riders open up. And that was the second ball he'd, he'd caught in the tournament. He'd already got Amy de Villiers from earlier in the tournament. <laughs> Work it out. Somebody's upstairs watching, working out who's hit it over the fence. Oh, that's a that's a great collectible to have in your uh, on your mantelpiece. I'm very interested in this, uh, you know, your snippets of uh, UAE life there, because obviously you're living there as an expat. These guys are living there as as expats as well. You know, what's it like being in a society where you're, you know, you're physically there, but you're you're very separate from the, you know, the the local Arab population. And obviously, your job as a cricket writer is mostly targeted at people who are not locals and like completely separate societies, and they almost never really intersect. I, I find that really interesting. So, what's it like living there? It's a difficult one to answer when you've been here for a long time because you're sort of stuck in your ways, you mix with the people that you mix with and you only occasionally have a crossover. It's, I mean, obviously, it goes without saying that it's a very peaceful place and everybody's, you know, the societies, while you end up sort of birds of a feather flock together, while you end up sort of mixing and talking to the similar people of like similar background to you, obviously in the workplace you're thrown together with you know, other workers from other nationalities, like there's guys on my desk, one's Sri Lankan, one's Indian. All the rest are English, actually, embarrassingly. So, but we've had um, American staff and all sorts. So, it's it is a good meeting pot in terms of um, a melting pot, I should say, in terms of meeting other cultures and understanding other cultures. Like far more so when I came from the UK. Looking back now, I was so ignorant as to other cultures and certainly like Islam. Obviously, living in a, in a Muslim country here, just know far more about it now. Um, but in terms of reporting for perhaps South Asian audience, most likely, and not seeing any Emiratis say that it's been very few that have played cricket o- over the years. As a result, you don't really necessarily end up mixing with them or finding too much out about their culture unless you actively sort of go looking for it. And um, I suppose it's some people will, some people won't. So how'd you end up there? You said you'd been there been there a while, English guy with a lot of English guys on your desk. What took you to, to the Emirates? Yeah, so I was working at my local newspaper, just started out in journalism and saw this job advertised uh, over here at a startup newspaper that's now defunct or either that it might be a website now nothing wrong with that no yeah <laughs> the, the national the national started a couple of years later so i switched over to, to there at that point um and that was it really i suppose the first the reason for doing it coming over here was just a bit of an adventure really as you'd probably get the same answer if you spoke to most expats certainly western expats we only came out here for year or 18 months and that's 15 years ago so i think you, a lot of western experts would say exactly that about their decision to come over here so we've seen the women's ipl uh recently in natican chance and from an emerging perspective we've seen thailand's natican chance and represent the trailblazers who actually went on and, and, and won that tournament uh unfortunately for us though the participation from her was quite limited and and not down to you know, any fault of, of her own whilst energetic in the field and pulling off a couple of unbelievable pieces of fielding which we've now all seen across social media she only got to face one ball in the entire tri-series and i did some working out today that there were 12 players above her in the runs column at the T20 World Cup earlier this year, but nine of them are playing in the Women's Big Bash League here in Australia, which means that statistically speaking, she was 
probably one of the better players at the tournament with bat in hand, yet she fell down the order, um, which was quite disappointing for, for all of us here. Just looking at it from uh, from a perspective a little bit closer than us all the way here in, in Australia, do you put that down to anything in particular or is it just a case of maybe some bad scouting or, or some bad team management by the Trailblazers? No, I think it might. there might be something in it, actually, that there is a suspicion of players from non, non-mainstream cricket countries because if you look at the T10 when that's here, there's a guaranteed spot in each 11 for a UAE player yet they very rarely get a chance to have any influence because they put I mean uh, and obviously T10 is a little bit more different because there's you know there's only a few chances realistically for, for people to really shine in that at the top of the batting order anyway and then the bowlers what they've got two overs so so they're only going to get you know limited chances UAE players haven't particularly had a great chance in that Paras Katka when he came and played last year Played one game, I think, and got a couple of overs to bowl at the end. And that was just like an afterthought. Um, just trying to think. And so even Sandeep. Sandeep was well scouted and they wanted to give him a chance in the IPL when he first went. Sandeep Namachani this is. But it was just difficult getting him in the 11. I think that was probably the, the perfect example of good scouting, actually, because they weren't doing it. They had a little bit in mind that, you know, Nepal's... Um, but they wouldn't have given him the chance if he wasn't, you know, if he hadn't shown up well at the brief little trial that they had with him. And so it's just the case. I mean, it's a bit frustrating that she's perhaps not had the chance to show what she can do because once she gets that chance, there's that jaw, the door that's slightly ajar now. She'll be shoving it further open for everybody else and for herself as well, like Sandeep's done, obviously. So while it's frustrating, it's the first sort of step along the along the road, hopefully for. Her and for everybody else. It's a situation we do see a fair bit, and and I think it's an argument that we've made multiple times on, on this particular podcast, where the leash doesn't seem to be as long for an associate player once they are given that opportunity. And, and say if if Sandeep was to now, I uh, know that Sandeep last year actually was given a little bit of an opportunity and, and took wickets when he got the chance, but I remember he was was fighting for a place with domestic players in India, and, and once again that's another you know, dimension to that whole situation. But, you know, if Sandeep was to go out and play the first game of the tournament and go for none for 30 or four overs, I dare say that he he wouldn't get picked again. Whereas if it was a high-end full member international player playing in that tournament or a really good domestic player, then I think, you know, there's that idea that that player will get another chance. Whereas, you know, Chantum in this situation, you know, looking at the runs that she scored in the, the T20 World Cup, you know, there's no easy runs for Thailand. They're playing up against quality opposition, you know, no matter where they turn. So if anything, that kind of proved that she was good for that pressure situation, but we just never got that opportunity. What's the what's the sort of view from, from your end in terms of the women's IPL? We know that they're slowly expanding it year by year, but it's it's not quite at the level where they could potentially mirror a, a men's tournament. Definitely not to the level that, say, the women's big bash league is to the to the men's big bash league. What's the the view over there of the tournament itself? Is it sort of achieving relative goals in the in the women's game? Not particularly here in the UAE. I must say it's gone by the wayside really without being noticed, particularly until and and that's through bad scheduling in the first place and then bad luck in in the other because. Obviously, they're scheduled it in direct competition with the WBBL, so you're not getting a load of stars from that over here who people would know, like Alicia Healy, whoever else, Elise Perry, whatever. Um, and then also, just by bad luck, they had uh, when the, when the best group game was reaching its climax, and people might have, you know, neutral observers who might have looked in on it, they did, they just didn't because uh, as the group match was reaching its quite engrossing climate. So I think it was a two run finish in the end. That was literally just as CNN were calling Biden as the as the president elect over on the other channels. So it's a nightmare bit of timing for them. So obviously anybody who might have been looking in just wouldn't at that time. And then the last game is the final, which was pretty good and didn't have any competition for it. And then also, as we were saying about uh, a bit of fielding went viral as well. So that was a saving grace. And that's right. She was probably turned out to be the star of the tournament just because that one moment was the one that would have been seen by more people than, than any other moment, really, because of the scheduling of it. Well, it's funny seeing that today. And I, I guess we do have a slightly jaundiced view of... Uh of what's going out there what's being shared and that you know crick info and the icc are jumping on interviews about people talking about her not not her speaking to journalists and, and replays of the fielding and the catch but 
Look, I'm glad that you you said it that you think it's it's a discrimination piece, really. You know, is there any other way of looking at it? Because you know, it's kind of like I want to get all the good things out of the way. It's great that there's a women's IPL, a women's T20 challenge, and that's growing because we can speak to a blue in the face about the power of women's sport and and the potential of what a an Indian women's T20 league could do. The Natakan is there as a, an ambassador for a country for the emerging game, etc. But let's all push that to one side. Look, unless She's having an absolute mare in the nets and can't hit the ball off the square. <laughs> Why the hell? <laughs> like Bez, great. You should you should work in stats, Bez. <laughs> Why the hell is someone who, again, of, of the people who were left in the event who played in the World Cup, uh, like the most recent international career that everyone's playing, being batted between seven and nine? And we only say seven because that's where she was on the list in the other game that she, that she didn't get to bat or wasn't going to be coming in next. I, I just find it really offensive to everything that that we're passionate about and, and what these cricketers put into the game that that somehow you know well you can just imagine the, I'm just imagining the coach looking around the room oh, oh it's an easy one to go with the, the person that I know when you know this is the same person that scored an amazing 56 a, a, against a full member nation and as Bez said there was no easy run scored runs against India A only weeks before that that World Cup and is, is just overlooked um, and it you know I saw Matt Roller's tweet and I'll, I'll, I'll read it out you know feel fanatic and Chantum, went through quarantine, COVID tests, time away from home, pre-tour training, etc., and ends up facing one ball at number nine in three women's T20 challenge appearances. It's like, true, that's a very diplomatic way of putting it. I have a lot of other thoughts and I had a, a lot of other tweets ready to go and drafted, but just thought, no, no, no. Bitterness is not the way way forward here. <laughs> but like, how does the game move forward if players are going to be treated like that with one of the most exciting talents in the world? And in the end, people do notice a talent by way of her fielding. But, you know, that's that's lucky. That's her being reactive. And I know that, you know, interviews with Jonty and we know what it, what good fielders are. They make their own luck in the field. But I just don't get it. Now, Radders, it's not a matter of sort of me, me pushing back at you, but, you know, you're in the middle of a, sort of a emerging cricket world there of some of the best stadiums in the world in an associate nation and seeing the way that cricketers are thought of in the country. What, what What's the next step for cricketers from associate nations to, to take that step forward? If Sandeep can't be thought of the same way and, and Natakin isn't, What's next? I think they're different cases. First of all, I, I know what you said before about um, about Sandy. You know, if he went for thirty, it's slightly different in Sandy's case because as soon as they signed Ravi Ashwin, his chances of playing this season were very tough. He might have had a go through the middle of the tournament, but then Rishabh Pant got injured, Carey had to play, and then um, again their fourth overseas player berth is, is gone. And then they towards the end their bowling, their seam bowling wasn't good enough, so they wanted to get Sam's in. So that's a bit different. That is done on probably based based on the overseas player quota. Whereas Natakan is a slightly different... Yeah, it's still, I can't really... Without sort of indulging your... <laughs> Please, please indulge me. I, 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 yeah. I, I, need, I need this. Yeah, come on. He's, he's, he's served you up this half folly there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I can't really offer it, anything different to what you said, to be honest. It's just a case of... Just as Sandy did, and he only got his chance, remember, with, I think, three, four games to go in that mm. first season that he played... Oh, and it, yeah, Delhi were gone. And that, that's another point as well. They only brought him in when the games didn't matter. Yeah, and they chucked him in, opening the bowling against the Villiers and Kohli and uh, Parthi Patel, whoever else. I mean, you know, and he showed he could do it. So it's just literally that case, that one chance for Natakan getting that chance and showing she can. And obviously, it depends on them, whatever, whatever way it comes to her. Maybe it is in a dead rubber like Sandy had it at the end of the tournament. Her getting that chance and showing she can do it, that's just the only way, especially with these, you know, this is the Indian series we're talking about at the end of the day here. So <laughs> is there any other country that thinks about, you know, their their own needs more than anybody else? Yeah. And, and to your point on the, the T10 before, I guess, when you said there is a guaranteed spot for a UAE player, you know, we talk about this a lot about, you know, even the, the Euro T20 Slam not having guaranteed slots for associates from outside the, the three nations that were hosting it. You know, it's I think there's got to be a broader view here of how you actually are helping to grow the game beyond just, you know, lining the pockets of the, the, the same players, the same coaches over and over again. That's not to say that those players aren't skilled enough to be getting those spots, but there's got to be a broader view here. I guess that was more my question rather than those those two players themselves. It's just, it just seems to be the same record over and over again of the talent being out there. And I know that, you know, in his impassioned piece, you know, Jay Danciani, you know, called out Paul Sterling as another example of, of players who haven't got their chance in, in franchise cricket, and although he's played in the BPL, but 
talent that's been there that, that don't get those chances. I just wonder as as time goes on and franchise cricket becomes so central to players' development and players' chances to being seen on the global stage is, you know, where are those opportunities going to come unless you get lucky? Like, we, well, Sandeep got lucky to get get picked up in the first place but you know it, it shouldn't be by chance there should be a system that actually encourages them to come through i just it just pains me to think about where those those next stars are coming from yeah it's it's a point actually because it's something you could say oh it's it's slowly happening because you've got sandy from those guys but then if you look back at kevin o'brien 2011 how is he going to advertise himself to a big hitting tournament like the ipl any better than scoring a 50 ball 100 against england in the world cup in india if he's not going to get a chance then what other chance has everybody else got well, and that's when we had a World Cup that uh, that had more than 10 teams as well. I know we've got a, a T20 World Cup that has more and, you know, hearing whispers that the next few World Cups may actually be a two-group affair, although that's not confirmed. I think that's something that they're thinking about in the future. But it, it, again, as you would reduce and uh, contract those those opportunities, you know, like you said, if he didn't get in then, well, those that chance in a World Cup isn't there for an island anymore. Well, one one thing that I thought about was that the Thai team mentality, which has been their great strength, is their their teamwork and working as a unit. You know that mentality of being putting the team first and and not being selfish. I guess I wonder if that maybe worked against Natakan in in the sense that you know if you want to break through as a T Twenty mercenary in you know the franchise circuit, you kind of need to be a bit selfish and a bit you know self promoting to get those gigs. So I don't know. Maybe she's a bit too uh, a <laughs> bit too much of a team player in in a way. See, I, I think that's just more down to Thailand just being overall a very good team from an associate level and then moving into playing against full members and, and having a lot of different players contributing to their success. But I know that I think in, in times gone by in terms of World Cups where associate teams have participated in those, a lot of those teams had maybe two or three really good players. But if you were to have a Kevin O'Brien or, or someone of that ilk be knocked over early, it exposed the rest of the team who maybe weren't quite up to that standard but I think Thailand kind of have the yeah as you said they're a very strong team but I think that's more of um, a result of just overall being very good players individually and all contributing into the success of the Thai team whereas you know maybe one day international and, and T20 teams of yesteryear at the associate level playing it at the next level of the game have yeah maybe two or three really strong players and then if they're carted around or, or knocked over early it becomes very difficult to, to pull their way back. To bring it to maybe the the state of the game in in UAE, and we'll talk about the challenges that the the national teams had over the last 18 months in in so many different respects. To bring it, I suppose, to domestic tournaments in in UAE, UAE, we've had troubles with the UAE T20X and different tournaments in that part of the world for many different reasons. What's the domestic state of the game at the moment in UAE in trying to not only build, say, domestic talent in the country, but also to attract those from overseas to play in it as well? Well, it's all stalled at the moment because, um, well, I was going to say COVID, but actually because of the IPL, there's not much happening at all at the moment. Um, other than that, they've been talking about a new whiz-bang T20 tournament, go figure. Um, it, that's been on the agenda for a while, not necessarily along the lines of T20X in terms of their accent on uh, associate players. I think they'd be looking a bit more at the Indian market for that, maybe. And then the T10 has been, it should be a vehicle really for getting UAE players' exposure against more international players. It hasn't really worked out that way but it might do there's possibilities for that like there were a couple of players that actually got their chance in it last year and did pretty well who the UAE have got their eye on there's a left armor called Shiraz Ahmed who was good in that in terms of the domestic game here they had a domestic T10 tournament just before the IPL just after lockdown um, where all the best players were were playing against each other that was quite a good formula for it I don't know how well it worked out it was live stream so the coach who was abroad at the time in India for a lot of lockdown Robin Singh did manage to get to see everybody playing and see the new talent and there was a little bit of a little bit of about obviously the team itself the national team is going through a bit of a transition from Dougie Brown's time to Robin Singh's time and it's been difficult obviously with Robin being away because of COVID when the airports were shut he couldn't get back from India and then the IPL happened he's had two months of that with Mumbai Indians but uh, you know long term maybe maybe it'll all work out well from that perspective I know that some of the national team players actually even guys who are very close to Dougie Brown um, have said yeah they've been they're really glad of what Robin has been doing for them even if it has sometimes been remotely but when he's been here uh, they've been impressed by what they've seen so there's reason to be optimistic but it's difficult to see what 
you know, what the international calendar is going to look like, and then as a consequence, what the domestic calendar is going to look like just because of the situation in the world at the moment. So it's difficult to answer that one, you know, with a firm answer. So just taking a step back there, you're talking about Robin Singh, who probably a lot of people will know of from his time as an ODI, pl- ODI player for India. There was over 100 ODIs, but hopefully just as many know the name Dougie Brown from his time playing for Scotland and for England and, and coached in the UAE. Like from an outsider looking in, his time in the Emirates was amazing. He brought a disparate sort of team going through a, a cultural change with the older players leaving and a younger group coming together and leading together. Um, fought through a poor back end of the World Cricket League Championship through or Cricket League Division 2 and then all the way back to ODI status and to the point where they actually stopped Zimbabwe's World Cup dreams in their tracks in front of a packed home crowd in Zimbabwe and then he's sacked uh, we hear nothing everything's great training together and contacts in the, in the UAE including the departed you know, CEO talked about how great he'd been for the team and when they were looking at hiring a new coach it was almost a, it was just a fait accompli even though Dougie being from the UK and the team mainly well, all being South Asians was able to really bring a, a unit together and breaking down a lot of those barriers that sometimes hinder those sort of cross-cultural teams what what happened well, there was this case, I don't know if you heard, <laughs> uh, where, a few, <laughs> where a few players got chucked out for fixing. Um, as a result, the team got knocked out of a qualifier that without that happening, they, well, they'd have breezed through. Re- realistically, they'd have breezed through if they'd have had all those players playing to the top of their abilities. And Dougie, you know, they'd be looking forward to a World Cup and you wouldn't be able to replace uh, the coach that's done that for them. Um, so it's just the fact that they had that nightmare before the qualifier that they did, then it was virtually impossible for them to make it through. And then, but even then, after that, he got, you know, he managed to drag them out of that and put together a really exciting young team actually that he could have um, put his thumbprint on and, and sort of mould himself to become an even better side than the one before was but I think that they saw the chance to get Robin Singh who's offers something different he's well regarded and the fact that Dougie's team technically hadn't made it to the World Cup meant they were within their rights to replace him it's pretty harsh when you when you um, put all the facts behind it together but then at the end of the day, Robin Singh's got a good CV as well. So that was their chance to get him. And they felt that they needed a new voice at that time. Then we'll see how it pans out. See, I would have thought that the fact that they almost qualified with, you know, half the team being suspended on the eve of the tournament, that in itself is an amazing achievement. And yes, you know, arguably they should have qualified with, with a full strength team. But the fact they came so close uh, is, is a testament to Dougie Brown's ability to, well, to manage a crisis and, and to you know, bring them together under stress and I don't know I, I just find it quite strange that they'd take the first chance they can to ditch a guy who who is obviously has that much skill as a as a leader and as someone who can bring talent through yeah I agree also I think that whole situation that you just mentioned the fact they got close it speaks to the fact there's a lot of talent here the guys that came in from nowhere I didn't know two of them you know they were excellent players immediately up to speed and if the same thing happened again well I may let's hope it doesn't um, but if if <laughs> if they suddenly lost a uh, lost a couple of players again, you, you can imagine their replacements just coming in. Just honestly, it's from very rudimentary sort of domestic. So, well, the A division domestic game is quite good, but underneath that, it's just like cement wicket matches on sandfields or or street cricket where these players come from. The amount of talent is incredible. Like the guy I mentioned before, Shiraz Ahmed, who did so well in the T10, literally is a table cricketer who lives in labour accommodation in, in Jebel Ali Industrial Zone, who just plays table cricket with his mates on a Friday and he was bowling at I mean you know he was sharing the new ball with Lassif Malinga I think and Dwayne Bravo was in the attack as well and he was just completely unfazed by it because the table cricket matches funnily enough certainly back in Pakistan perhaps not so much here you actually get quite good attendances sort of equally as much as perhaps the T10 did so that uh, speaks to the fact that he wasn't phased by it but yeah I think I've gone off topic there but it also yeah I, you, you, it was great because you were just about to lead into my next question actually you talked about the pipeline of young players that are, are coming through in UAE at the moment and we saw not only in the, the senior national team purely because they had to step up because there was no one else available but a lot of those players did really well when they were given the opportunity the likes of you know Jonathan Fiji yeah. uh, Vrida Aravin Palanya Penmeyapan they played in the under 19 World Cup um, I think all three of them as well where have those guys come from where have they excelled to, to, to move into that senior team yeah so you're quite right actually I'm um overlooked that when I was answering the previous question said about the amount of talent that comes through table there's actually in terms of the 
age group cricket to the senior team. That has become, certainly on the last vestiges of Dougie's era, they were happy because they'd been preparing the under-19s team for the World Cup and they'd seen a lot of those players and they knew their characters, they knew their ability. They were happy to throw them into the senior team when, you know, everything bad happened, basically. And they showed that they could do it. So hopefully, and, and apparently Robin Singh's very strong on that as well. He'll, he'll back youth if it's good enough. And there are a lot of those players. It actually stems from the fact that sort of, well, when Dubai, the UAE itself has had its construction boom and it's tried to attract expats from different sectors, not just the oil industry. So the population's boomed and every sort of sector has had, you know, improvements. And for people coming from the subcontinent, cricket is a big thing for them. So there's been academies sprouting up here, there and everywhere, not least obviously the ICC Academy, which is very, very high spec. Similar in Abu Dhabi, the Zayed Cricket academy there very very high standards getting it getting better all the time uh, there's a new one that Dougie's actually backing that's sort of in conjunction with Rajasthan Royals and all that actually just goes to show the under 19s team and the players that have graduated into it Kartik Mayapan who you mentioned Jonathan Figgy a couple of others who, who might be sort of borderline making it into the team whenever they get back together that just goes to show that having all these whiz bang facilities and not having players come through that immediately it doesn't mean that it's not the right thing that's been done and it doesn't mean that it will reap rewards at some point. And that's been happening for as long as I've been here, all those things have been set up. That's 15 years. The ICC Academy was just breaking ground more or less as soon as as soon as we arrived back then. And now you're seeing these guys who have been trained at that academy being ready to go in international cricket near enough as soon as they're, well, Kartik, Fritia Arvin was still at school when he got his chance in the ODI team. Uh, he's come through that. Kartik, who you mentioned, loads of other guys. So, yeah, while there's always going to be that, you know, that ad hoc talent that is in uh, table cricket and domestic cricket, be it organised or less organised cricket, now they're getting a steady run of talent coming through age group cricket as well that they can monitor far better than they could do in the past. So so I think that it's, it's a brilliant thing for UAE cricket. Can you talk a little bit more about about these academies you know I, I sort of think of private academies and those that are listening for not their first pod have, have heard us talk about the USA and the, and Nepal you know those private academies have sort of grown out of a, a need really because there hasn't been a, a national body that's driving development or they just don't have the means to but yet I look at the UAE and you've got all these big names attached to, to different academies whether it's MS Dhoni or Robin Singh that the last I looked the academy he was involved with seemed to have actually shuttered uh, and wasn't running anymore. You know, can you talk about how the academies work, how they fit the pipeline, and is it only for the rich kids? That's a good question. That is a good question because in a lot of cases, sport, everything over here, well, depends what you're pursuing, but cricket can be quite expensive and they need to pitch it. Like if you're going to train at a facility that's got soil flown in from Brisbane so that you've got a hard, fast wicket to bat on or the gabber or whatever. They're going to want to see at some point down the line a return on the investment that they've made, which has got to be massive for something like that. So obviously they're going to have to charge a rate um, and it's it's not cheap. Um, so certainly, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one to answer because it feels like, to answer your question, poor kids come through Tape Ball and the rich kids come through these posh academies. And it's, you know, quite an ugly thing to say that. But there are, you, you know, there's academies because the private academies that aren't necessarily associated to the cricket stadiums, they have to find, you know, areas to play, gr grass to play on if they want to do proper fielding, you'd have thought. And turf nets, grass fields, there, there's not a huge amount of them around and expensive to hire. So a private academy who wants to keep their costs low anyway is going to find it expensive. So it's going to be tricky at any level um, to keep the costs of being at a private academy, whether it doesn't matter what amount of facilities you've got or what you own, it's going to be difficult for it not to be a price. It's funny, as, as you're talking, I'm thinking of the kind of the things that I know, you know, the UK and, and, and Australia. In Australia, you've got the private schools, public schools, but then they all dump into grade cricket or premier cricket, and that's the proving ground. Very few kids will, will fall from high school straight into first-class cricket, where in the UK, it could be very different. They can fall out of private school, you know, public school there, into count the county system, and they, they never have that chance to really have to grind their way through and, and, and the runs. And I guess we're taking two extreme full-member examples there and it's great that we're having the conversation about the, the way the talent is coming through in a place like the UAE you know I think we did the profile and there were literally 
hundreds, if not thousands of teams out there playing in various leagues across the numerous Emirates. So it's really more a comment here than, than anything in that they've got to get to a point where they all get a chance to be on the, the same playing field, really. I think that that's my biggest challenge. If kids are coming through these parallel systems and then coming out this pipeline at the end and then then they're ready for national selection. Very hard for a coach or a selector to be comparing these apples and oranges coming out of different tubes. And just as you mentioned, so the ICC Academy, I always found this intriguing when I learned about it, that everybody hears the ICC Academy and thinks it's connected with the ICC when it's not. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's a location next to the ICC. Licensed. That pays money to use the, the branding of the ICC. So, I, you know, whilst they've got great facilities and a lot of the national training is based around there and that they sort of share facilities, I think it's one thing that's all, always useful being pointed out that they're not actually anything to do with the ICC. Yeah, it's a pretty good name to attach to it. It's, it's touch on what you said before. You, you've got, um, well, MS Dhoni Academy, Kevin Peterson briefly had an academy here. It, funnily enough, the individual player academies haven't generally had, had a very strong history. ICC has been, ta- well, the office is right next door. So uh, attaching their name to that has been very successful for them for whatever cost it, it costs them. <laughs> but it's just a thing that's done over here. A lot of stuff is imported over here. And if you're going to import prestige by giving a name like all the golf courses are named by there's Montgomery obviously after Colin Montgomery Els Club after Ernie Els just a thing that's done that's quite interesting. Um, I don't know. Relating this back to the more of the administration side, there was a, a sort of you know you talk about this being kind of privatized and you know everything's importing names. The UAE board was um, given an enormous amount of funding by a, a property mogul recently, and it reminded me a lot of the US style situation where it, it almost seems like the sponsor is calling a lot of the shots. And I guess that kind of fits in somewhat with with the way that the um, I don't know, almost the patronage system that the the UAE has. You know, do you think that structure, you know, that new structure has started affecting the way the game is run in the UAE or, or has it not made much of a difference at a, at a ground level? I don't think it's hugely different to what it's always been, to be honest. I think that's how cricket sustained itself over here. It started in the first place because, well, that's right, because an Emirati, funnily enough, uh, did uh, his... I think school or maybe university in India got into cricket that way. Sultan Zarawani, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, sorry. That's actually Abdul Rahman Bukhati I'm talking about. Oh. Sultan, Sultan got to it in, in exactly the same way. It's funny enough, a few Emiratis that have been involved in cricket. So Abdul Rahman Bukhati obviously was uh, Victor's Benefit Fund series. So Sharjah Cup, basically, and Sharjah Cricket Stadium. Pretty sure he was at school in, might have been Pakistan, actually. Sultan Zarawani, the first captain of, of the side that went to World Cup in 96, he got to it in a similar way. A few Emirati that have come to the game have come to it in really interesting ways, actually. I think the most recent Emirati to play for the UAE team was a guy called Alawi Shukri, a real big, rich um, businessman's family. Dad, his dad wasn't in the cricket at all. He was a real big football fan. Um, and Alawi was at home uh, during the 96 World Cup. Yeah, yeah, it would have been the 96 World Cup, I think. I might have my dates wrong. I think it was the 96 World Cup. And his Sri Lankan au pair was watching and <laughs> and she was going mad, crazy about the cricket. And um, very rich family over here. They had other staff at their at their house as well. And that happened. They were all Sri Lankans as well. <laughs> and they were all coming in and I was like, what are you all doing? And um, they were like, this is cricket. This is cricket. And he got into it. He got really into it. And it's a shame that he's dropped off the radar. And so he could have had a real influence on cricket. But anyway, sorry, that's going off kilter. Yeah, getting back to your, to your original question. But, but yeah, the patronage side of it is, is how it's always been run, even like A-division cricket. The reason a lot of ready-made cricketers come here from the subcontinent, Pakistan in particular, because these guys who might run a, you know, a successful cement business over here or aluminium, I think um, the guy who runs T10s is aluminium. So they, they're into cricket because they're from the subcontinent. To reflect their business being successful, they want their staff cricket team to be the best staff cricket team as well. So they hire players in, whether they're, you know, if the, if the tournament rules allow it, they might be, you know, like Cameron Atmar, he might be flown over just to play a, a Ramadan tournament for this guy's staff team or he might want a more permanent team. So he'll import players and give them a job as like, I don't know, one of the UAE wicket keeper at the 2015 World Cup was a receptionist. And other guys like, there's other guys who do jobs like that are just socks really. They're, they're just given to them. And I know one one of the employers over here, Annie Sargent, who um, 
used to tell all his cricketers not to come to the office ever because they were just <laughs> they were just a nightmare in the office. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I have to bring it up. It, it, like it, this is Mr. Burns and he and his team of ringers, isn't it? You know. <laughs> <laughs> the isotopes go to you're Dale Strawberry. <laughs> look, this is our like, 130th podcast, and then finally we have like the <laughs> the uh, you know passport player expat reference that I can tie <laughs> into Mr. Burns's ringer. <laughs> now, th- th- there's a good trivia question. Now, which was the player who refused to play because he had a very important job in the? <laughs> oh, um, I can't remember either. He got radiation poisoning. It's oh, it's gonna it's gonna kill me now. Will I be able to play softball tomorrow? <laughs> No, you'll be lucky if you can even breathe. And I was worried about going off at a tangent. <laughs> I, I find the whole, you know, like we've got women's cricket as, a, as another point coming up, which I find really intriguing about the UAE because there seems to be, again, a lot of talent there that could actually be another shining light of the, the women's game. But I just find, to Nick's point earlier, these sort of parallel worlds running side by side and, and how cricket... I'm trying to think back to uh, to chemistry, it's a, it's a true conglomerate because nothing is actually mixed. Like they're they're all there as a part together, but there's no actual bonding going going on. And, I, and if we can imagine all the concrete with all bits of stones and stuff in it, but not actually kind of mixing the. But yet you've had these teams that have made World Cups and the talent of a Karam Khan in the in the early the early 2010s I'm trying to think what do we call this that decade again to this team that came through a fixing crisis to then be taking ODIs off the USA and a women's team playing through their own their own cultural challenges these private academies not not as rich kids coming through tape ball it, it, it just really intrigues me that, that there's just so much potential in a place like this that I feel like we could talk about this for a lot longer which sort of takes me to, to women's cricket you know there's a team that first-hand knowledge were not included in the the Asia qualifiers in 2016 because they weren't seen as, as strong enough and it, and it was you know, a very kind of um, wet finger to the wind decision made because there hadn't been any cricket played by the national team, where now they're one of the teams knocking on the door to be, yeah, you know, to say the next Thailand. It's a completely different story. But tell us more about what's happening with women's cricket there. Yeah, well, that's paused uh, as a, a little bit at the moment. But in actual fact, good news with the um, Rajasthan Royals Academy. Rajasthan Royals is a franchise that um, really promotes. Uh, they want to attract women fans. They want to attract women players. And their message goes beyond that as well. So the newest academy that's popped up, that I just mentioned, Doug, the one that Dougie Brown's backing, have got scholarships for leading players. I, think, I can't remember what number they said. It was sort of like six or ten players are going to be able to go and train there for free. Um, Graham Kramer, former Zimbabwe captain, is the head coach there. The facilities they've got there, sorry, it's easy to mention ICC, Abu Dhabi, and, and forget about the Sevens, which obviously is a rugby ground, has the most beautiful ovals there are and, and lovely net facilities as well. That's where that academy is going to be. So that might become a little hub for, for women's cricket. So, um, But out there, there's two grass cricket fields, aren't there? There's three now. Yeah, three. And there was, what's it called there? The, the, the sand fields, but they have a different... Yeah, they've got a number of sand fields as well. So they got... Yeah. yeah, so it's quite a cricket that a lot of people over here would play would be cement wicket sand outfield um it's an odd sight because you see the roller rolling the outfield rather than the pitch <laughs> um it takes a bit of getting used to the old sand cricket but um yeah so the women's might become a little bit of a hub for that but also charges charge is very good so i keep overlooking charge when i'm talking about all the good facilities obviously that's great and charge has a lot of cricketers because it's got probably a higher proportion of um subcontinental expats over there so um charge should always feature in these conversations and they've always been ahead of the game with uh, in terms of women's cricket as well so i think there's um shoot for optimism as well in the women's game there's a there's a lot of ways we can go from here one, one of the things that immediately strikes you know popping up in my mind here there's you know there's so much going on in the uae one of the things that I, I, I often kind of wonder is, you know, what about the other Emirates? You know, we all know Abu Dhabi, Dubai and Sharjah, but that's only three of the of the seven Emirates, right? What, what's going on in the other ones? Well, Ajman would be the next. Ajman, so it goes Dubai and Sharjah are very close together. They sort of blend into, blend into each other. And then Sharjah on the other side is Ajman. And that's got a very active scene. Uh, very active cricket scene. A lot of good players come through there. Um, <laughs> you might say they're all stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to bring it up. Yeah, yeah. Ajman's had a lot of problems in that regard, as you just mentioned. Obviously, Ajman All Stars being the most um, noted, but also the guy in the Kadir Ahmed case, who's um, I forget his name now, but he's, he's not 
anything associated to the national team, but it was also mentioned the first place being participant in cricket who they... Sorry, when we say the Asian Man All-Stars, we mean that ludicrous tournament that made its way to YouTube that not preempted, but it came around at the same time as Al Jazeera with those guys running down the wicket and trying to get stumped and then trying to get run out, but then the fielders not being able to get the ball in. So it was like the old, the two boxes, you know, throwing and missing until they both fall over at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they're both, they're both paid to uh, to throw the game. So when I, when I watch it, I don't know if I want to laugh or punch the monitor oh. of my computer. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, cool. There, you see that, guys? That's the, that's the soul of our game. No, nope. uh, do you get another one? No, nah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's it. Sorry, Raiders. I I'll let you talk. I just thought, as well, laughing about the Asian Man All Stars, not everybody would uh, would know what we're talking about. In your guys' brilliant interview with Steve Richardson, he mentioned that, didn't he? And did he say? Sorry, that's a, just that's the head of investigations for the ACU. Did he say that? That's I'm trying to recall what he said about it. I think he said that they're getting to the bottom of that, aren't they? Or, or... Uh, he's get, they're getting to the bottom of everything that came out of Al Jazeera. Oh, was that what it was? Okay, right. Yeah, it was, I think it was kind of all encompassing, saying that out of everything that that happened with that documentary and the evidence and the ICC had investigated, it, it sounded like when we interviewed him, and not to talk out of school, but it sounded like something had happened, and it was basically just a matter of of when news was going to be announced. Yeah. Good, good plug on our interview, though. Thank, thank you very much for that. <laughs> no, 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 that was brilliant, guys. It was absolutely outstanding that interview. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, Ajman, so Asman's got an active scene beyond there. Um, Alain is in. Oh wow, this is embarrassing. Pretty sure Alain is in the Emirate of Dubai. Should know, but it's miles out in the desert, like the an hour and a half that way. So it's sort of on a on a triangle. You've got Dubai City here, an hour and a half that way is Abu Dhabi, hour and a half sort of on a triangle point from there is Alain in the desert. They play a bit of cricket and I think they've made a little bit of inroads in getting in Emiratis to play the game there because it's a less it's a lower percentage of expats in that city. Um it's a but it's pretty much a one culture, one one sports city that their football team there's massive, biggest in the country, and everybody in the town wants to play for the football team, which means you know, not everybody can play for the football team. So what other sporting options have they got if they can get the casts off from, you know, football, talented, spatial awareness people, blah, blah. Um, if they can get a few of them involved in, in cricket, then all good. I'm not sure quite how well they're doing, but they, they were certainly making inroads for a while. That's in LA and that's a, that's a city rather than an emerald. I think it's in Dubai anyway. That's the end of part one with Paul Radley. We'll have part two next week. Make sure to subscribe to the Emerging Cricket Podcast if you haven't done so already so you can tune in as soon as it drops every week. Pass the pot around and make sure to give us a five-star review. If you want to support us financially, go to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Emerging Cricket where you can support us from as little as $2 US a month. You'll get access to extended cuts of a number of our shows and you'll have a say on the show's direction. For now, on behalf of Nick Skinner, Tim Cutler and myself, Daniel Beswick, see you next week.